facts and values. This is difficult. I can't. If you want the plan to reflect your values, this plan that you're in the process of developing now with King County Metro, it's going to need to work with the facts. And one of the things that I've really come to specialize in is helping communities uh, uh, and helping people understand what is actually a fact, what is actually a value, and how those things can interact. Because it's like pie. Many of the facts about what public transit is and how public transit works are geometric facts. They're facts like this one. Any circle in the world, if you measure the distance around the circle and you divide it by the distance across the circle, you get a number that's a little over three. It's called pi. We're really sure about that. <laughs> and that's how you know that's a geometric fact, because we can stand here on this planet and know that that's true anywhere in the universe, because it's just a fact about what circles are. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do tonight is to be aware that much of what we know about transit, we know geometrically. We know with that sort of factuality. And I want to introduce some of those ideas tonight and encourage you to be aware that when transit professionals are talking with you about transit, they are, in, they are wanting to help you work with those facts because only if you work with those facts can you implement your values. I hate to break it to you, we value everyone's opinion in this room, but we are not going to ask your opinion about the value of pi. <laughs> and the reason we're not going to ask you that is that your opinion about the value of pi has no effect on pi. So it's one of those things where we have to work with the facts of transit that they are, which are actually wonderful once we get to know them and present us with all sorts of wonderful possibilities and present us with certain choices, but we have to work with those facts. I want to quickly outline some of the biggest and most important facts because they have to do with, uh, very much in tune with what Mark was just saying, what kind of community works best with public transit because it is a geometric fact about public transit that it doesn't work equally well everywhere. Um, if you want a high ridership transit system, and I'm not saying you should, but if you want transit that lots of people ride and that's therefore getting lots of cars off the road, here's the recipe. All day service, frequent and long span service following patterns of density, walkability, linearity, and proximity. What do those four terms mean? Density, very simply, if there's more stuff going, around, going on around the stop, more people living there, more people going there in that fixed area around a stop, we're going to have more ridership out of that stop. More than anything else, density dominates transit ridership and it does for a brutally obvious, and again, I want, I want you to believe this the way you believe in pi, that it's something that's geometrically obvious, that the more stuff is around a stop, the more potential riders we have. All, you're going to talk with people who, are, who have all sorts of emotional reactions to the word density, and they're entitled to their reactions, but what the word density means is the amount of stuff in a fixed area, and that matters enormously to transit. Walkability. This is Mark's great green slide. I don't have to do this slide because he just did this slide exactly. It, you've got to be able to walk to the stop. There's Mark's slide. Linearity. This is a peculiar thing to transit. People want to travel in straight lines. They want to travel in things that feel like straight lines. A development pattern in which things are in a straight line is a great development pattern for transit. A development pattern in which things are off up a hill on a quarter mile or half mile long driveway from the main street is a terrible geometry for transit. And that's something that applies regardless of the density. Um, Finally, proximity, all other things being equal, we would rather carry people shorter distances than longer distances. It costs more to carry people longer distances. So I hope that's all obvious to you, and I hope those kinds of things can be obvious to you geometrically, to the point that if you see a study that t finds that transit is not really related to density after all because somebody has done a bunch of regression analysis, I hope you won't believe that because we, somebody, you know, we could do an experiment about the value of pi, too. We could have a bunch of people measuring circles in different places, and they'd make mistakes, and there'd be some noise in the data, and maybe somebody would come up with some other number. But no, that's not how we do it. 
These are geometric facts. It's about the geometry of what transit is and how it interacts with the community. So the facts frame the questions that our values must answer. For example, this question. I just showed you what the necessary features are for high ridership service, but maybe you don't want high ridership service. But here's the trade-off we have to talk about. We can pursue high ridership, and what that means is chasing the dense and walkable development with very high quality service and not serving a lot of other places that don't have those features. That's what a high ridership strategy does. That's often, and what do we get out of that? Well, we support dense and walkable development. All of our green outcomes of transit, all of our environmental outcomes, VMT reduction, those all come from people riding transit, not just from transit existing. Those all come from ridership. And finally, minimum subsidy per rider, the fiscal conservative outcome, if you like, that also arises from people riding transit, not just transit existing. But there are also a lot of good reasons why people want transit to just exist, even if it's not ridden very much. And, that in, and, and why you see transit agencies demand, you know, under the demand to spread their service out and run lots of service that we know won't carry many people. Goals like access for all, supporting low density development, crucial lifeline access for everyone wherever they may have ended up, however expensive it is to get to them. And of course, service to every member city is a very important idea in a multi-city place like this. The point is not that either of these is right or wrong. The point is that these are in conflict. The point is that these are opposite purposes of transit uh, and that we have to work through those trade-offs and come to a position about how much we want to spend on one of those things as opposed to the other. And indeed, the service guideline, the service standard system that you have here in King County Metro is a very good way to start with that because it organizes the question in very much this way. Now, in my last couple of minutes, I just want to show you a few pictures whose effect I hope is to just sort of give you a new way of thinking about what it is that transit planners seem to be trying to do when they suggest certain things. This is a map. Uh, that's created, it's created by a company called Conveil. This is Portland, Oregon, my hometown, and what happens here is that I've plopped my pointer down on downtown Portland, and it has shown me where I could be in 15, 30, or 45 minutes on transit plus walking. In other words, that's a map of my freedom. And I encourage you to think of freedom as something that is at stake in transit planning, and that this is probably a pretty good way of drawing a map of it. One of the cool things about this is that it allows us, who, we who make location choices, anybody when they're deciding where to locate anything, can take responsibility for the consequences of those choices. Right now I'm looking for office space in Portland, and I could locate in downtown Portland, and those are all the places where, where employees could get to me. Or I could spend a little less and locate in a neighborhood that's maybe more analogous to, I don't know, Fremont maybe, and that's where people would be able to get to. Or I could locate in a suburban business park in a leafy, low-density corner of the city, and that's where people would be able to get to me. And I want this attached to every real estate listing because everyone needs to take responsibility for these consequences of their location choices. Because in sum, I want to promise you, no matter what the bus system does, no matter what the transit system looks like, your mobility, your freedom to access your city will be a result of where you are. And I know that many low-income people don't get to choose where they are. But anybody who does get to make that choice needs to make that choice in an awareness of what these impacts are. Because once you've located in a place where transit can't get to you, there's a limit to what transit's going to be able to do. So I want to just quickly end it there. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to this discussion.